Good afternoon, everybody. At the outset, let me welcome you all on behalf of the Asiatic Society, which is the oldest center of learning and research, not only in our country, but in the continent of Asia, since it was founded by Sir William Jones in 1784. Sir William Jones, by profession, was basically a man of jurisprudence and came down to India as a judge of the Supreme Court, but he was equally identified as a pioneer Indologist of British India. He was a polyglot by interest and was globally known for his intellectual achievements in many academic fields. The rich attainment of the tradition in Indological research that was set during the late 18th century was followed up first by a set of Western scholars, mostly European, then taken over gradually by the Indian scholars. Dr. Rajendralala Mitro, the first Indian president of the Asiatic Society in 1885, stands almost as one of the few academic stalwarts at the mid-19th century, representing the period of Bengal Renaissance. A life of less than 70 years that he lived between 1822 and 1891, Dr. Rajendralala Mitra could be easily singled out for his dedicated scholarship, versatile genius, proliferated intellect in more than one areas of excellence and achievements. He was born in a family of Sanskrit scholars and thereby inherited a legacy of Indic tradition on which he further developed an emergent Western academic tradition. His flair of Sanskrit was equaled with his knowledge of English and some other Asian languages apart from his skill in mother tongue that is Bengali. All these were demonstrated through his immense contribution in various subjects of cultivation from prehistoric archaeology to modern literature, from editing of Sanskrit manuscripts to editing of Bengali periodicals and from cartography to photography. Many of these specialized areas of Dr. Mitra's introspection will be highlighted by today's speaker, Professor Malovika Karlekar, who is associated with Center for Women's Development Studies, New Delhi. She is an expert on the archival photographs, uh, on the archival photographs. She has to her credit a number of important publications such as Revisiting the Past, Early Photography in Bengal, published 2005, Visual Histories, Photography in Popular Imagination, published in 2013, Memories of Belonging, Images from the Colony and Beyond, published in 2015, and many others. Professor Karlekar's lecture will be the third in the series of Dr. Rajendralala Mitra Endowment Lecture that was instituted at the Asiatic Society. The first lecture was delivered by late Pranab Mukherjee, our honorable former President of India on 20th November 2017. He spoke on Dr. Rajendralala Mitra and Indological Studies in the Asiatic Society. Incidentally, Sri Mukherjee was the chairman of the planning board, the highest 
policy making body of the Asiatic Society. The second Dr. Rajendralami Trendomen lecture was delivered by Professor K. Paddaya, former director of Deccan College, Pune, on 26th July 2019. Professor Paddaya spoke on learning from the indigenous learning from the Indological research of early native scholars. To conclude, let me remember on this occasion that but for his abandonment of becoming a physician or a lawyer, the Asiatic Society got a dedicated researcher in the broad field of Indology by dint of his committed scholarship and rose to the highest position of this heritage institution. His entire range of activities have been brilliantly reviewed by acclaimed scholars in a seminar publication brought out by the Asiatic Society in 1978 on the occasion of his 150th birth anniversary. Dr. Rameshchandra Majumdar, a renowned historian, observed he, that is Dr. Mitro, he was preeminently scholar and a literary man, but he had likewise a great grasp of public questions and was undoubtedly one of the foremost public men of his generation. Rabindranath Tagore, in his writings, appreciated Dr. Mitro's scholarship and spoke high of his literary contributions. He mentioned quite disheartenedly that Dr. Mitro's remembrance after his death by the public at large was perhaps eclipsed by Pandit Ishwachandra Vidyasagar's death a few days after Dr. Mitro's demise. With this, may I now invite Professor Malubika Karlekar to deliver her third Dr. Rajendrala Mitro Endowment Lecture. Professor Karlekar, please. honored to be giving the third Raja Rajendralal Mitro Memorial Lecture. So Rajendralal Mitro was primarily known for his outstanding contribution in the field of Indology. I'm going to deal with another very important aspect of his work, that is his involvement and contribution to the photographic process. Born in 1822 to John Mejoy, grandson of Raja Pitambur Mitro, who had distinguished himself at the court at Delhi, the young Rajendralal grew up in a cultured and literary environment. His varied interests, deep commitments and scholarship and his working life reflected an enterprising young man. His initiative and drive in taking advantage of the new opportunities that were increasingly available in the city of Cal Calcutta was so very palpable. Here he is in a formal studio pose, looking into the middle distance, very common with compositions of the time, looking into the middle distance. In 1846, his interest in Indology took him to the Asiatic Society, where he was appointed assistant secretary and librarian. He worked there till 1856 and was the first Indian to join the tradition of scholarly work at the society established by Nathaniel Hallhead, Henry Thomas Colebrook, William Carey, and James Princep. While his duties as an official were diverse, Rajendralal wasted little time in acquiring the methodological and research skills required for antiquarian research and published regularly in the society's journal. The prevailing intellectual atmosphere of scientific inquiry and the privileging of reason led him to argue for objectivity in approaches to Indian history, interrogating thereby some of the reigning canons and discursive methods. It was this mindset that led Rajendralal to the newly arrived photographic enterprise. 
In 1851, soon after the, after the illustri Illustrated magazine had made its appearance in Europe, Rajendralal started the Illustrated monthly magazine Bibidhar Toshamgroho in a large format, that is 8.5 inches into 10.5 inches. And it consisted of an interesting melange of articles in the natural sciences, art and literature. Interspersed with reproductions of lithographs and paintings, the magazine, which reflected the editor's early interest in visualization, was perhaps among the first illustrated publications in this genre, certainly in India and possibly worldwide. The reader could be assured of information and analysis on a wide range of subjects within a few pages, a significant contribution for an increasingly literate and aware population eager for new knowledge of the world beyond. Today, I would like to take you on a related journey, a journey I feel a man of Rajendralal's vision and interest might well have taken had he been born a quarter of a century later. That is of a visual documenter. One, would have used the, one who would have used the camera to record his own life and work as well as that of others. His commitment to photography and its promotion put him quite ahead of his times. When the British brought photography to India in 1840, their primary aim of using it as a tool for recording ethnographic types, surveillance and research was soon rivaled by the demands of the popular imagination. Though the colonials started using commercial studios by the end of that decade, it was almost the 1860s as photo studios mushroomed into three presidencies that the Indian urban, upper and middle classes responded enthusiastically to the new medium. Soon, like the Western style English medium school, the railways, for postal services and modern medicine, photography and the photographic establishment came to, <coughs> to occupy a growing space in the middle class consciousness. <coughs> the photo studio acquired a special significance, providing an enclosed space where often a fantasy world could be played out. Backdrops painted on canvas were unfurled and displayed as were selected props such as impressive tomes, elaborately carved furniture, pediments, exotic indoor plants, and so on. With the invention of the box camera by George Eastman in 1888, photography entered the world of the amateur and of, and of on-location shots. It also became a medium for recording and documenting, and in time, a powerful mnemonic device. Aware of the power of the medium, Indians started using the photographic studio from after the middle of the 1850s. In fact, interestingly, the first images of family compositions seem to have been taken about 1857, the same year that India was going to witness enormous upheaval. By this time too, Rajendralal Mitro had got interested in photography and as we shall see, started using it extensively, both in his scholarly work as well as in Bividat Toshamgraho. He was a founding member of the Photographic Society of Bengal, established in 1856, and within months of its establishment and the starting of the journal, had written five articles in the first three issues, including translations of French essays from Le Pays and La Lumiere. He also provided a succinct account of photographic information gleaned from a number of European art journals. He was among the handful of Indians to join this predominantly European group of professional photographers, interested amateurs and army officers. It was, uh, photography was really very, very popular amongst the army. And in 1857, Rajendralal became its treasurer. Soon, however, he became embroiled in a controversy with the British members over his outspoken views on colonial rule. I have dealt with this imbroglio elsewhere, but what is interesting here is that he had enough influence to be able to move out and to start another organization with two Englishmen as president and vice president and he himself was the treasurer. In addition, the issue was kept alive through the columns of the Hindu Patriot of which he was editor between 1884 and 91, the Bengal Hurkaru and of course the Englishman and the friend of India. A few years later, one Mr. Groth started protracted negotiations with Rajendralal regarding his return to the 
to the parent society. It's, it was clearly to the advantage of the photographic society to have Rajendranath back. By now, a figure recognized as one of unquestionable eminence in both official and photographic circles. He rejoined in 1868. Apart from informed discussions on experiments, innovations and experiences of the society's members, a number of photographers themselves, while it is a matter of some speculation whether Rajendra Lal's photographic skills went beyond those of a talented amateur, he certainly had substantial technical knowledge and interest in the area, organizing successful exhibitions of photographs with both Indian and foreign participants. However, as we know, it is in the field of Indological research that his contributions are the most significant, and between 1870 and 1888, he discovered many valuable manuscripts and information about them was published in nine volumes of notices of Sanskrit manuscripts that used a process of systematic cataloging, the first of its kind for old manuscripts. In his archaeological research, where he built upon the work of Captain Skitto, the Cunningham brothers and others, Rajendra Lal introduced the visual element with great skill and dexterity. And what is important for this evening's discussion is that he was soon cited as an authority on the interpretation of photographs of sculptures. In 1878 was published his richly illustrated Budgaya, the hermitage of Shakkomuni, with 51 plates that were color types of photographs that's based on a process of lithography of the monuments as well as sketches of plans and structures. And these are the three photo. I show you three photographs of views of Budgaya where you can see each image is detailing the intricate work on the facades. As would be expected from someone so committed to photography, Rajendralal possessed a number of cameras and several photographs, such as these two, that are supposed to have been taken by him and are part of family albums in the possession of Dilip Kumar Mitra. One is that of a Tripura princess and the other is of Rajendralal's widowed sister-in-law. This photograph of his sister-in-law is particularly interesting as women alone were not subjects. It was usual for them to be part of family compositions. Over here, she is dressed in widow's weeds and the lady poses with religious beads in hand. I now move to the second part of my lecture, extrapolating on the trajectory that Rajendralal Mitro's life might have taken had he been born half a century later. I trace his journey as what I've called a time, time traveler and argue that he would have used the camera very imaginatively, going well beyond the ambit of archaeology and Indology. He would have used it to record people as well as places and added his wisdom to the trajectory that photography took in the early 20th century. I feel that he would have recognized the emergence of the iconic persona in the public space and the role of the photograph and recording, if not promoting such personalities. Second, Rajendra Lal Mitro understood the need to build and nurture institutions and organizations, the Photographic Society of Bengal being a case in point. After a brief digression into the, into the democratization of the photograph, I focus on the life and times of Rabindranath Thakur, and I believe that Rajendra Lal Mitro would not only have supported Tagore's endeavors, but also ensured a systematic photographic documentation of them. As I've already mentioned, by the final years of the 19th century, the arrival of the Brownie cabinet presented the opportunity of democratic, uh, democratizing the photographic space. It not only fractured the divide between the public and the private, but also introduced the possibility of the camera being everywhere and available to a far larger number of users. Though the paparazzi era was not to assail people's lives and sensibilities till well into the middle of the 20th century, by its early years, photojournalism was beginning to find many takers. I argue that as, that as is clear from his introduction of the illustrated article in, the, in Bibidartha Shamgraha, an extensive use of images in his scholarly work, Rajendra Lal Mitro would have been at the forefront of those promoting the use of the photograph to record changing lives and times. I feel that he would have been involved in this process 
and he would have wanted detailed explanatory ca captions as well. A true scholar, an image without a context would have little meaning for him. He would surely have understood the importance of celebrity lives being documented through visuals with supporting text and might even have been a willing subject himself. But for that, he needed to have lived and worked not in the 1850s, but in the 20th century, a time when the camera was perceptively but irrevocably moving into people's lives. What began in the last century assumed, assumed even greater salience, as we know, in the 21st. The world of today valorizes icons, elder statesmen, women e achievers, revolution, revolutionary leaders, film and television stars, sports heroes, leading composers, musicians, artists. The list is endless. All qualify for distilled attention of various kinds. Biographies, empathetic, critical, carping, keep them alive in the literate universe. Retelling the lives of such finger, figures is never easy. Most often, the hagiographic mode is the usual, though not always acceptable way out. In the present world, for wider transmission of iconic status, the visual, be it a garish multicolored poster, a calendar image, or a classy studio portrait, a quick shot taken by a digital camera, a mobile phone, or even a fuzzy, out-of-focus grab from a television image is taken for granted. A visual rec reconstruction of some of these persons, their work and the times they lived in is helped by the setting up of photographic archives devoted to them. <clears throat> in the process, a subtle subject photographer engagement that may even meld into more active participation by the individuals being photographed was not unusual. I turn now to Romindranath Thakur, the establishment of Shanti Niketan and his trips abroad to finance, uh, to finance Bishwabharati. The camera became a vital aid, and though Tagore's life and times have been widely photographed, there has been little informed analysis of how photography was used to record the growth and development of this unique personality, or indeed of his passion, Bishwabharati. Today, by sharing some select images, I hope to correct this lapse. In part, the idea and growth of photographic archives in the 20th century fulfilled Mitro's commitment to the visual. In the 1950s, the poet son Rotindranath started the photo archive section in Bishwabharati's Robindra Bhavan. He needed to find an appropriate home for the many loose photographs and albums that visually mapped his father's life. That of his illustrious family, the establishment of Bishwabharati, Sriniketan, and so on. Thus, in 2014, when I worked there as a visiting professor, the Rabindra Bhavan holdings consisted of almost 17,000 images, the largest single collection of photographs, most in fairly reasonable condition, of Tagore, his family, and of Shantiniketan, and of course, Bishwabharati. Some files and albums were annotated regarding provenance, origin, and so on of images, others were silent. While, as in the case of with much of photographic practice, quite often, unfortunately, photographers remained anonymous and details of provenance and even persons are tantalizingly absent. However, this was not really always the case with the Tagore archives. As we, as we shall see, Tagore was prescient enough to anticipate the expanding role of the camera and invited more than one photographer to Shantiniketan. The photographic recording of Tagore's life and works is also a com competent example of the histo history of photography and changing discourses around it. It was in 1901, a decade after Rajendra Lal passed on in Calcutta 1891, that in not so far away Bolpur, Rabindranath Thakur started his school with five students and the same number of teachers. And here he is, photographed in 1905, in what was to later develop into the famous Chatim Tala. This is also a carefully composed, posed image. Very clearly, he was participant in the posing as well as positioning of, of himself, of his clothes, etc. His father, the Maharshi, had bought some land there and built a small guest house meant for Brahma householders to spend some time in meditation and prayer. 
It is not as though the education experiment was received enthusiastically by the Bengali Bhadralo, as Tagore's biographers Krishna Dotto and Andrew Robinson write. Many would have a patronizing smile at a poet's impractical fancy of, I quote, living in huts, learning under trees, at the mercy of the seasons, bad food and water shortage. Shantiniketan was not a place for those with worldly ambitions. And this is an image from a private album of what it looked like, look, must have looked like in 1901. This photograph of a hut amidst trees conveys the rustic atmosphere of the place. Whatever may have been people's views, Robindranath was satisfied enough with the school that on a trip to the US in October 2016, he wrote to his son, Rothindranath, that I have in mind to make Shantiniket on the connecting thread between India and the world. I have to found a world center for the study of humanity there. And here there is, a, this is a photograph of him in Salt Lake City. Again, a pose photograph and the poet stands in the middle of the frame, looking away from the camera. On December 22, 1918, the foundation stone of Vishwa Bharati was laid and it was inaugurated three years later. Between 1919 and 1921, Robindranath Thakur concentrated on fundraising in India and through lectures in Europe and the US. Audiences were filled to overflowing and during his 1920 trip to, the, to, the Ameri uh, to America, he had hoped to raise as much as $5 million. However, in the post-war world, this was a gross miscalculation. And as he wrote to an English friend, I am suffering from an utter disgust for raising funds. Be that as it may, between 1872 and 1932, Tagore had made 30 trips abroad, the later ones at which he gave lectures, quite unabashedly as fundraisers. On a number of his trips, Robindranath was usually accompanied by his, photo by his son, Rothindranath, and daughter-in-law, Protima. Many photographs were taken on such trips, often in formal, though very carefully thought out poses, as this one of Rothindranath and Protima with the poet. You can see how carefully the chairs have been positioned and the three that stand in the center of the image, of the frame. In December 1930, at a formal banquet at Hotel Biltmore for 500 dignitaries, including the governor of New York, who was then Franklin D. Roosevelt, every seat was occupied and hundreds lined the walls to hear him speak. The New York Times reported in, on December 2 that about 4,000 people were in the hall and thousands were turned away. We have a photograph of the poster advertising another one of his talks. On a long view of the jam-packed hall, there is a handwritten inscription. The New History Society meeting reception in honor of Sir Robindranath Tagore, 2,000 people present, Grand Ballroom, Ritz-Carlton Hotel, December 7, 1930. These are the two photographs, and both of them are from private albums. By the time, by this time, a somewhat travel-weary Tagore returned to Shantiniketan. His university had opened its doors to many foreign visitors, though it was 20 years since his friend Okakura Tenshin had passed on. The Orient had a fascination for him. In 1937, China Bhavan was set up for Sino-Indian studies and scholar Tan Yun Shan was invited to chair the department. It was also when Robindranath Thakur became increasingly aware of the power of the image, and he thought it prudent to invite established photographers to record life at the university and in Shantiniketan. Thus, in 1932, Raymond Bournier and the Frenchman Alain Daniel Liu, musicologist, artist, writer, and of course, traveler and photographer, found their way to Shantiniketan, where they spent four years at the invitation of Robindranath Thakur. They soon became an integral part of the insyncretous vision of the institution. Burnier's Laika framed the poet, unique buildings of the educational complex, its students, and general ambience 
that subtly merged the lushness of rural Bengal with understated structures, while Danya Liu actively collaborated in a musical enterprise. From 1935 till Tagore's death in 1941, photographer Shombu Shaha made frequent visits to Shantiniketan and tiles, tirelessly photographed the poet. Everyday life at the university, students and persons who worked with the poet, his images, these, his images, two of which follow, are amazingly fluid and alive. We see the poet with his secretary, Anil Kumar Chondo, and his wife, Rani. She was to become an accomplished artist, trained by Nandalal Ghosh and others, and a noted author. It's probably taken about 1936 or 37. At the same time, a number of young women and men who were to become famous in later life spent formative years at Bishwabharati. Among them was Gora Pandey Nipant. She was to later become the noted Hindi author known by her pen name, Shivani. Here she is, back to the camera with a friend. Another candid shot, informal candid shot taken by Shombu Shah. As public adulation continued to grow, the camera that was there to memorialize events, iconic as well as quotidian. This photograph of Robindranath's 70th birthday celebration at Calcutta Town Hall captures the crowds as well as the poet addressing them. Quite often, a few of the more interesting and possibly intriguing images are taken, perhaps unbeknownst to the subject, such as the one of the elderly Robindranath listening intently to the readings of an astrologer. This is the following photograph. The comment with the image is, showing his hand to a palmist. Shuren Kaur and Nandulal Bose, the few others, are anxiously listening. That's the caption. Some of the more poignant images of his final days are from private albums maintained by members of the ashram. So that Shantiniketan was also called the ashram, such as the one of Robindranath reciting a poem at Amro Kunjo, in what is perhaps among the lowest photo, and you see him here reciting and we can't see too much of the crowd, but it is out in, in the open. And this was possibly also in about 1940. In what is perhaps among the last photographs to be taken of the poet in May 1941, he is seated by a window at Udayon, looking out onto the verdant beyond. Here is this last photograph. If you look at it for a while, you will see the detail his hair is trimmed and beard groomed. The shawl and blanket are neatly, neatly arranged, as is the vase, vase with a few flowering branches carefully positioned. It is a finely crafted photographic tribute to a man who valued aesthetics and the natural world so deeply. I shall end now by recounting select aspects of the life of Robindranath Thakur through photography. I have shared with you how the camera was complicit, if you like, in the fashioning of an icon. I would I'd like to leave you with the thought that though Rajendralal Mitro's major contributions were to Indology, had he lived half a century later, I am convinced that his passionate involvement in his work would have been enhanced by the extensive use of photography. The camera would not only have recorded his scholarly achievements, but also different aspects of his life. Together with Robindranath Thakur, with whom he might well have worked, Rajendralal would have been among the first to be iconized by the camera. That would have been the natural progression of the new invention. I confess that I might have been somewhat fanciful in using the literary image of Rajendralal Mitro being a time traveler but I think that it describes rather well what might have happened. The seasoned Indologist would have combined his commitment to the ancient with the modern and carried forward his use of the camera to newer pastures. His experience of photography, as well as understanding, interpretation of images was way beyond that of most of his contemporaries. He was truly an experimenter, a quintessential time traveler whose knowledge of Indology was well matched by his far-reaching interest in science and scientific discoveries, the camera 
being among his foremost interests. Thank you.